here in the film. Fucking Gal Gadot's there. There's <laughs> also a cat that's Kristen Wiig in this movie. Bam, bam. Hi. Bam, <laughs> bam, bam. The counter, bam, bam. you need the counterpoint or the melody is not clear in the viewer's mind. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, that's right. Mm-hmm. If you're not seeing something, you're a sucker. You're all you viewers out there, you know what's up. Welcome to the audiovisual podcast we call Frame Rate, the show where we rate frames. I'm Michael Swain Rate. I'm Abe Epperson, the other guy. Didn't yes and me with the Epperson rate. I appreciate you standing your ground, but I heard the hesitance. I, you almost did it, even though it makes no sense. How long have we worked together? Sometimes I just have to like let your bits just fall off like water. <laughs> Die. You know? That's right. I just close my mind off to swim sometimes. Sometimes um, Michael swims. Sometimes you just get so strange and I'm in. <laughs> right before we started rolling, we were talking about the least well-received piece I've ever done, which dropped today, uh, set an all-new precedent at the place where I work, an all-time low in terms of like-to-dislike ratio. So that feels really good to hear, Abe. Thanks for letting me die yeah. on this horrible you, you day. You feeling real confident right now? The end of my comedy the, career. That's right. All the sides giving you positive vibes, you know? That's where we want you. Well, if no oh, one's going to introduce me, I am internet legend Sean Baby from the internet. Hey. Seemed a little hey. presumptuous and abrupt, but all right. <laughs> yeah. It's a little early. You kind of cocky, but you, you know. got to let me bitch about the state of my career for, you know, it's Adam Todd Brown rules. I got to have like a 10 minute bitter and then we go. Anyway, Sean <laughs> Riley is here, aka, oh, should I not say your real name? No, should it's not a name? secret. I mean, sure. Oh, great. I never it's- know. I call Jason Pargin Jason Pargin, and I don't understand if that's bad. But uh, <laughs> well, he doesn't you know. go by David Wong officially anymore. That that nickname has run its course. And uh, is that true even in the Zoe punches the future in the Dick book? I think that the latest release might have Jason Pargin on the cover. Really? I'm not sure. Really, I forget because I'm his friend, and he sent me an advance copy, mm-hmm. but I don't even remember. Um, hey, you two. Anyway, what a hey, Take control, man. What the hell is going on? Do you want me to take control? I'll take control. You I, like that? I want you, like you to that, take you control weirdo? because this is a weird, uh, a.k.a. fans will love it, B-movie-esque episode where we're not covering the type of movie we'd normally cover. And when we do that, B-movie. Michael goes insane and says <laughs> Michael does go insane. You guys, I'm looking uh, forward to this. You guys said, hey, Sean, what, do you, what movies do you want to uh, watch? And I think I, I listed about 12 and you didn't pick any of them, and you said, hey, what about Wonder Woman 1984? I'm like, fucking okay, fine. It, why did you ask me that? Yeah, that is that is a great That's mystery. definitely what happened. <laughs> <laughs> way, way to throw us under the bus with lies. The bus that you built with your two hands. I'm happy yeah. to be here, though. Thanks for having me, I see me, guys. your grift. Yeah, oh, yeah to pleasure you, to have you. Always. So yeah, we're talking about Wonder Woman 1984, which came out this year, the year of COVID. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yeah... Uh, I kind of want, because the aforementioned emails, uh, Sean, you had a lot of, it sounded like you had a lot of, um, uh, gripes with this one. And what we typically do in frame rate podcast is we typically have the guests kind of do a two part, like explain real quickly what it's about in case people haven't seen, which doesn't have to be long at all. And then they, and then you explain, (laughs) I, I will, I'll phrase it like this what this movie means to you. Okay. So. Interesting. Okay. Um, I don't have anything super prepared for this, but um, I've of course seen the film. Um, Wonder Woman 1984 is uh, set in the titular date and it's about Wonder Woman uh, secretly fighting crime. Like she's, uh, she's dressed like an American flag. So people like recognize her as a superhero in a world where uh, superheroes, uh, I guess, exist. Uh, Sort of, I think uh, that's not maybe not as important if I'm trying to get through this. That fast. is not a top level point. <laughs> <laughs> not a top level point. So um, her main antagonist in this movie is uh, Pedro Pascal, who has a wishing stone that he absorbs into himself. So he, when you touch him and make a wish, it comes true, but in a full on monkey paw way. So uh, all hell breaks loose, several wishes into this disaster. Uh, there's also about 300 other ideas thrown into the film and uh, nothing quite works 
the way the producers intended. And uh, it falls apart into a, a horrible, terrible mess. Uh, I think that's it. I think that's the plot you need to know. That there's a wish Produced guy. Produced by Zack mm-hmm. Snyder in part. Okay, great. He did a, a terrible job. Um, okay. So yeah, uh, I think the who was the writer the the woman who wrote the writer was um, I believe it was a group of writers, but this one uh, Patty Jenkins, the director uh-huh. who directed the first Wonder Woman, right. wrote it along with co-wrote. Two yeah, uh, co-wrote and also directed this film. Okay, so we don't have a single person to blame, obviously. But um, and I guess the movie sort of feels like that. It feels all over the place with many, many ideas. I think another important point I probably should have brought up is that early in the film, uh, Wonder Woman uh, wishes her dead boyfriend back uh, to life, and instead of mm. the wish just saying like, "Okay, cool," it quantum leaps him into some random dude, and the character does not even get a name. He's just called Handsome Man in the credits, and they just hijack his body and make passionate love to it for days put it in all kinds of That's terrible right. danger and he is sort of the co-hero of the film like a uh this this dark passenger inside an unwilling subject so mm-hmm. yeah this is what mm-hmm. happened That's after right. the end of being john malkovich basically mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right he went on to then get taken over <clears throat> by wonder woman uh wonder yeah. woman's boyfriend chris pine <laughs> okay but what does this especially grind your gears in a way that other recent superhero films haven't? Grind your gears is trademark, by the way. Please don't recapitulate that <laughs> when you answer. But uh, it did. Like, yes. why did you pick it? You must have a reason, Sean. Oh, I didn't pick this one. All right. This was not my doing. Uh, Wait. I, I do. I am. You're impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I am fascinated with it uh, because I don't think much of it is necessary. Like if she's got a guy who can do wish powers, that's enough. But they added a cheetah villain who's sort of tied up in it. Uh, and she's, I guess Wonder Woman's like probably main comic book villain. If you were to name Wonder Woman villains uh, and you could name more than cheetah, I'd be very impressed with your Wonder Woman knowledge. She doesn't have a deep bench. Uh, so, so Maxwell Lord and cheetah uh, are her villains. And I'm losing my train of thought just because trying to keep this movie straight in my head is is complete madness, right? right? Um, so this whole having a dude, having her boyfriend inside another man who they just quickly forget about, is kind of a a, a nightmare, right? Like uh, I don't like oh, to yeah. do this where you're like, oh, imagine if it was a woman, but like seriously, imagine if it was a woman, and you like a different movie you wished your dead girlfriend back and she just showed up in a woman you're like okay she doesn't know we're here let's let's have sex with her body you'd be like this is a Mm -hmm. Mm terror what what is this movie obviously we we don't apply all of these uh, standards to to every situation and even with it being a dude all three of us our cracked sense went off where we're like that is uh, unpackable as a terrible decision yeah by the creators someone someone should have said that yeah Obviously, yeah. if, if more it was a woman, specifically, it would just be, that is rape. Yeah, it would so, just be a, 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 I mean, a, 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 like a snuff film. Know, like you couldn't show this to anybody. But as a dude, I just want you to say it's it's seven out of ten, just as bad. It's um right, right. Uh, it's a pretty popular controversy. Like a right. lot of people pointed it out online. A lot of critics. Uh, it would be insane if uh, you didn't Patty mention Jenkins it. actually. Say again? It would be insane if you didn't mention it. I, if you talked about this movie for more than five of minutes to someone who didn't mention it, you should like check their basement for dead bodies. Like that's a that's a psychopath. <laughs> yeah, Patty Jenkins actually uh, had like a statement uh, to people like you know storming the castle, so to speak. I don't know if it was Twitter, but she argued that uh, she didn't feel it was as as much of an issue because it was following the trope of a body swap, similar to like Big or Freaky Friday. Okay, Uh, but there was no swap. As trope. Uh, Yeah, there's no swap. (laughs) Unless that guy got a tour of heaven for several weeks. Okay. No, just a coffin. No, no, because Chris Pine says, when I wasn't here... He says when I wasn't uh, here, the movie explicitly states heaven or like not Christian heaven, but that's right. He says when I wasn't here, I was in a place that I can't put into words, but it was good. So I assume handsome man is getting a tour of heaven, which that is a good deal. 
the point is rape is okay if they don't remember it, I guess is what the <laughs> right. movie's saying. And you go to heaven <laughs> yeah. while the rape's happening. Yeah, right, you disassociate and go to a pla- your happy place. In and, this um, case, heaven. I did do an article about this and uh, I wrote, uh, my article's a uh, very high concept. So the idea was I made trading cards for this movie, but they're all from the point of view of Handsome Man. So he was awake during the whole movie. <laughs> And very frustrated about what's going on. And the only way he can communicate is through trading cards. That's and great. the comment he made is mm-hmm. like, oh, yeah, boohoo. I have to, you know, they're using my body to have sex with the most beautiful woman in the world. And like, that's a fair point, right? Like, who, there's few guys that would be sure. like, okay, I'm saying no to this. Like, no, come on. But he, if mm-hmm. he's a handsome man, he's probably pursuing a couple of relationships. He, he's, he's almost certainly not just like available to just... Raw See, dog, someone during yeah, an AIDS pandemic. That arithmetic, it does that arithmetic. It's funny, you know, as a mental exercise, but <laughs> really, it's it. The entire thing is just about consent, right? Also, exactly. I don't even agree. Yes, yes or no? It's. <laughs> I don't even agree. I think that's more of a trope of the simulacrum of manhood that we all sort of buy into. That she is object. She's gorgeous. I agree sure. with that, even subjectively, but. I genuinely, and I'm not saying this for points of any kind, (laughs) like I have had sex with people that I barely know and I've had sex with people I admire deeply and have a friendship with. (laughs) And the latter is preferable to me to such a degree that like, no, it is not taken for granted that if I can have sex with a woman who's just attractive physically, that I would be, that I would give my consent to do more like, you know what I mean? I 100% agree. agree. And, And I... I sort of made that point on the trading card that like, you know, look, guys, I get that this (laughs) could be worse, but this I did not (laughs) say okay to this. Like, I'm not putting you to task or anything. I'm just I'm keeping us on task. Well, also why this movie is bad. As a Deadwood fan, I got to appreciate that I just realized a big arc in this film boils down to you got to die, Steve. Isn't his name Steve? Yeah. Yeah, Steve. Colonel yeah, Steve. you got to die, You got to die, Steve. <laughs> the, the Steve the Drunk in Deadwood. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Because the whole concept of this movie, which is uh, as typical to, you know, uh, every man stories or even the mythos of the superhero, they usually start with the first, you know, se- uh, sequence in the movie mm-hmm. is usually a parable for the truth that we're going to learn by the end that's going to set us free or destroy us. And in this case, it's <clears throat> that Diana learns that she can't cut corners because she has, we have a whole sequence where she tries to take the shorter path and uh, her teacher says, no, you can't do that. That's not truth. Real truth to be a true hero, to be a, like a legend, you have to do it the hard way. You have to be honest about everything. Mm-hmm. And therefore l- letting Chris Pine go away is ultimately her admitting that the, you know, she used the wish. She enjoyed the wish, so to speak. Uh, and uh, that is bad. So everyone should give up the wish. And that's what they do. <laughs> right. And it's all wrapped up in a bow. Up, kind of. Well, the moral of the story Hansen is Man. clear. Is it no is, bow. It's that taking the shorter path, no. cheating is evil. That's their like, thing they're trying to focus on. And I did mm-hmm. like one dimension of it, which is that if you create the monkey's paw situation, although... I hate that I uh, there's times where I like it. Like it, it, it bothers me in zombie media when they shy away from the word zombie. But in this case, it just points out that you have nothing original in your film when they yeah. go um, the Dreamstone. It grants your wishes. Oh, well, by the way, terrible dialogue alert. Also, Kristen Wiig goes grants your wishes. Sounds more like a dream stone to me. <laughs> like what the fuck was that comment even about? But, um, Jesus Christ. But, uh, and then Gal Gadot immediately goes, it's a wish with a trick, a monkey's paw. And you're like, yeah. it could have just literally been a monkey's paw. Who even gives a shit then? Right. Um, but I do like that. If that's the trope you're embracing, it, that connects to in a way that is sensible, right? Uh, cultures fall, because human individualism beats collectivism or some aspect of. So it's like they no one renounces their wish. Everyone wants what they want. And therefore, <laughs> it's literally the same thing The Wire is about. Everyone has interconnected self-interest, so soci- society must fall. And uh, they just go the other way at the last second. 
Yeah. By the way, yeah, they just have faith in humanity. They go the other way the last second because the villain Pedro Pascal decides uh, this ca- new chaos wish world he's created <laughs> with nukes flying everywhere endangers his son's life. Right. So he changes his mind. <laughs> if you deleted Wonder Woman from the screenplay, that would have happened anyway. That would still happen. Uh-huh. It's a yep. self-resolving plot. The other next mm-hmm, file. Mm-hmm. The other issue is I'm not sure they showed us a single wish in the movie that was um, that anyone would not want to immediately renounce. Like some people would like waste their wish on uh, coffee or like better traffic for Pedro Pascal getting to the airport. Or right. uh, one guy like uh, there was two that were like really close to just genocide. Like I wish all you Irish bastards just fucking go home. It's like yeah. I feel like once that comes out of your mouth, you regret saying it. Wish or not, like you're like whoa, whoa, whoa I gotta. Take a deep breath. I'm getting a little cranky. And then he's like, well, I wish you would fucking drop dead. And she drops dead. I think he probably was like, I take my wish back if that's if that's an option. One of the hugest problems is you cannot fathom Pedro Pascal's reasoning or motivations because they make no logical sense from his right. own point of view. He lets himself go to the brink of organ failure when he could have stopped it at any time. At any time. And he seems to not foresee the obvious, which is that... If you grant six billion wishes at once, so much random shit will happen that even if you're king of that new world, it will be destroyed. Like there will be dinosaurs yeah. and shit. You're telling me no one in the millions of wishes you granted said, I wish this guy would shut up or I wish you were dead <laughs> yeah. or I wish everyone was dead or like uh-huh. any random shit. Um, and at the same time, his son <laughs> Alistair wishes for his greatness, and unlike every other wish which has been instantly granted the first time the Forrest Gump wind goes by, that wish is never granted. Like, he never cedes his power to his son. What even was that about? <laughs> I'm exhausted. Oh, there's... Yeah. Yeah, there's plot holes. What I find that... Uh, I, I couldn't help myself, and I always think about, like, sketches that, like, we would make if we were doing pop culture observations. Mm-hmm. One of the ones that I would think about is, like, there would absolutely be... Because everything about, like, uh, what's his name? Mr. Lord, uh, his, his, you know, ah, take the wishes back, everybody. Right. Kind a deal to undo the entire mess the entire point of the film um there's got to be like one guy who's like has like an outrageous demand or wish he's like i wish that like everyone had like dicks on their foreheads and then you have to and then you just wouldn't take it back right right? yeah (laughs) and so you now have a scene with wonder woman like arriving at this guy's place saying like take it back that shit was weak he's like no (laughs) no i like it it's hilarious and yeah. Everywhere I look, it's there's dicks. going to be people who just don't. Like that's not how you solve. That's not how you have faith in humanity. Like I guess you have to have faith in a, a humanity as the aggregate. Like in the aggregate. I mean, like sure. uh, some people are going to be bad. Some people are going to be good. That's the reality. It's not to. You can't just undo. Like everyone's selfish. It's like something that the Dark Knight did when like everyone uh, there was the two boats. And it was just like, right. you got a controller and blow up the other boat or that. When you were doing these like prisoner's dilemma kind of situations, that's all theory. You don't take a side and just say, oh, everyone's good. Oh, everyone's bad. So mm-hmm. this movie is not even being true with its resolution, which is the least I'd ask out of something that is just like pulp, you know? I don't know. That bothers okay. me that they I just agree. don't. At, at the very least, they should have a a good message or a true message. That's literally the point of the movie well, is to say, go the true route. The message is, okay, so <laughs> Sean Baby, despite all his protestations, I swear to you guys, made me watch this. <laughs> and I did what I do, which means I watched it as deeply as I could, uh-huh. even knowing that, look, my opinion of superhero movies at this point is it's like, like when people are like, so-and-so appeared in WandaVision, I like two waves of vanilla pudding crashed into each other. I don't care, man. Stop telling me about it. (laughs) Um, Disney just did what? I don't. They're all a blur. But, uh, and they didn't start that way. I just feel that way at this point. It's sheer inundation. But um, Mm -hmm. anyway, you can apply close reading to anything and get stuff. And I got to say, bouncing off of Abe's point, that it was almost jaw dropping to me looking at it at that level when she says, well, she says wishes with a trick, the monkey's paw, it grants your wish, but takes your most precious, it takes your most precious possession. Right. Then the whole theme of the movie, and I'm sure this is unintentional, but the whole theme of the movie is 
uh, the recurrence of, or the motif, I should say, rather than theme of cultures collapsing. And the threat is that America is going to collapse uh, and then global society is going to collapse. And so it's just interesting to me that it literally enshrines your culture as your most precious possession. And there are weird moments when it's cutting around the world. Like you said, the Irish guy, it's, it's, <laughs> it seems more than glancingly interested in like, uh-huh. weirdly like geopolitics or segregation. Yeah, Cause that dude in the like, Middle East just like wished for the, what Palestinian wall. I can't remember the details, but just like, Oh, right. Let's and segregate then, they, these people. And that they chose to make the opening gambit, the first wish is also about like a free state. And I understand Gal Gadot has like a, a dog in that fight right. and that I'm sort of dancing around that and I'll stop doing that. I will address it directly. <laughs> um, yeah, I just think that became woven into the fabric of this is like a, a sovereignty and potentially the Israel-Palestine issue is very subtly woven into the fabric of this mm -hmm. movie, which is an odd choice. Yeah. Well, the, the rules really are all over the place. I guess uh, Wonder Woman has magic and like Greek gods. And so it's already sort of a mess uh, when it comes to like, um, I guess, pseudoscience rules. And a superhero movie, I think uh, you can go a long way by explaining uh, the limits of like a character's powers. And so then you can see them like overcome them or uh, work within those limits. Whereas with Wonder Woman... Uh, not only is she like seemingly invincible and fat, like she lassos a bullet, like that's the kind of thing where, okay, she could just do whatever she wants. Right. But then this other guy mm -hmm. has just wishes and then that's in his body and you're like, okay, so he has to touch somebody. And then, and, and so it's all but like, then later he's cerebro. He can communicate yeah. instantly. And with that took like a world. lot. That's what, that's, um, it's bad, but it's, uh, in, in this context, sensible like he's like okay so these particles count as touching right this is experimental mm -hmm. technology and it counts as touching and and they're like yeah right. okay and i'm like fine it's that's stupid as shit but it makes sense in the world you're building whereas nothing else did they have these weird wish rules it's like oh it takes your most prized position and okay so wonder woman that would be what the island of themiscara the mankind's capacity for love it's like no it's her superpowers mm -hmm. like what what I don't know. It's her boyfriend, isn't it? Well, she got her boyfriend, so it couldn't take her boyfriend. Oh, oh right, right, right. But um, that's what she ran. Unless so you're saying it. But I guess a monkey paw would be she would get Wait. her boyfriend, but he hated her. Right. Like, he, but she never loses her powers. What does it take from her? She, no, she it, was losing her powers as the movie went. But I think that might have been a side okay. effect of Cheetah taking them. Uh, but also, if no, Cheetah I don't, took all her I don't powers, think so. I think that's a side effect. That's it. No. Uh, so. The way I understand it, when uh, Kristen Wiig ta says, I want to be like her, that does nothing to Diana. I agree. Diana okay. asking for Steve, even though she didn't know about it, that's causing her power loss. Just right. like uh, Kristen Wiig asking for uh, Diana powers or whatever, she loses her humanity and becomes a less like good person. The Another problem, weak though, as fuck, though, is that she gets too... <laughs> guesses or two wishes which yeah. i thought they already said you only get sure. one yeah they so they that's care. a whole nother yeah, oh, and there's many little loose ends like that like if cheetah is getting all the exact powers and by the end at her zenith she has id you know nominally wonder woman powers plus additional powers uh why does shocking her she should be immune to shock in the same way that Wonder Woman is. They're the same. Why does falling into a bucket of electricity, as Kevin Malone would say, why does that fucking work? It, <laughs> I don't understand right. why that's a cheetah's weakness is electrocuted water, but it doesn't hurt Wonder Woman and, suddenly. And okay, like obviously we have the uh, gift of hindsight and we're, you know, massively talented writers, but like couldn't you just give Kristen Wiig's character like something that she loves, right? Like, Early in Act One, she's like, yeah. "Hi, I'm I'm kind of a dork, but you know the thing that keeps me going every single day is like my shoe collection. I love shoes, 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 shoes." And then like later, she does have like, an arc about her heels, <laughs> which is something like right, like and then yeah. like she goes home and like just doesn't care about them, like you know, and, and it just be like a dumb little wink to say she lost something, but like like Abe said that that she loses her humanity, but she never made a comment that like her humanity was important to her. I could see how, like, right. you know, Gal Gadot might care about it, but why? Why the fuck would she care? But 
if it's gone. So what is the monkey... Like, usually the monkey paw takes something... Or, like, all these wish fulfillment stories take something that is, like, the antithesis of what you want. Like, they find a cruel way to switch it around on you. This just seems like it's grabbing at whatever the the screenwriters want. Well, right, and ultimately when Pedro Pascal himself becomes the Dreamstone, he gets to choose, which is amazing betting on his you know what i mean before he went to the genie lamp and said i want to be the genie yeah how did he know that in the future when he's the genie he would get to sentiently choose what he gets in return for the wishes there's no how, way to know that ahead of time yeah how would he know that he wouldn't just turn into a rock <laughs> why didn't and that's he the turn end into of the movie a rock why that's isn't it. the curious case of benjamin button <laughs> end with a giant man-sized baby like it if make that's sense. what we all want to know if you're a monkey paw these are the things that we need to know if you're a monkey paw Hollywood that's your answer. easiest day at work ever if someone says hey i want to be you and the monkey paw's like oh my god this is the fucking I can twist this you're on right. you so easy. Here, you're a rock, dumbass. Yeah. <laughs> did you guys think... I thought Pedro Pascal did seem like he was having fun as essentially the villain from Freakazoid. I do. I loved his weird intensity yeah, he, where he'd like, like grab the dude. Passion. He's like, hey, buddy, what would you say if I, I could tell you you could wish for better traffic for me for like just, oh, buddy, you got to fucking do this. And I'm like, he's, <laughs> yeah. he's making some great choices. <laughs> uh, yeah. And they were all there working. Was fun. I th- actually thought yeah. the cast is not where this movie falls down at all. No. Nah. She's a fantastic Wonder nah. Woman. I like the little cameo from well, Diana Prince from from Linda Carter. Really, I mean the I thought the scene itself was rough to watch. Sure, and what that was the lamest credit sequence I've ever seen <laughs> attached to any. You know what I mean? It's a trademark, and I know this is a dumb thing to complain about, but it's a trademark of these movies that the animated credit sequence is anything, and this one was very bizarrely anticlimactic. Like they yeah, ran it's out just of a an conversation. <laughs> yeah, it was bizarre. Yeah. No, it's there. Uh, no, I man. mean literally uh, the way the credits visually look. Not oh, the scene. oh, okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah, sure. Yeah, go to town. Uh, We're deep in the he, criticisms. That's theory. what you're bringing up. We're like, oh, I have big shit too. <laughs> I'm just saving it. Yeah, we like, should. We should. Let's keep doing it. Let's keep going. One that really got to me was um, <laughs> their civilizations collapse. Uh, so. They imply everything that's ever happened essentially in history is because of the Dreamstone. Right. Um, Rome, Byzantium, whatever, Babylon, their civilizations all collapse catastrophically without a trace, and we know not why. A, the <laughs> giant wall that rose around this country one day will be remembered forever in history. <laughs> that won't be forgotten. Mm-hmm. One B, would think. We know why Rome fell. Like Rome, the idea that you would say Rome fell without a trace, we know not why. Without a trace, the Colosseum <laughs> still is standing. What are you talking about? <laughs> we wrote books on why it fell and what, like at the what, very what granular level. Yeah. And, uh, and yeah. it was immigrants. It was immigrants, is, right? Uh, Immigrants? This is literally <laughs> like don't learn from history is in is woven into the DNA of this movie. This is why America yeah. will fall because we're like, hey, Rome fell. We don't know why. Probably because of some dream. <laughs> Probably stone. a dream. Anyway, stone. America's going great. Dreamstone sounds like a America's nightmare going. stone. <laughs> that line Got could him. easily have been in this film. <laughs> easily, yeah. not a thing. No, jeez. Uh, so- do you guys have a favorite part of the movie before we keep going? I oh, wanted to do this. This is the big twist of the episode. <laughs> at, at some point, whenever we're ready, I'm going to pivot into a very passionate defense of why this movie is very good. <laughs> oh, really? I look yeah. forward to how ridiculous that I'm is so going looking, to be. And why my we're the part, bad guys. Sure, sure. My my favorite part is the uh, the guy who's stealing the... Uh, the stone at the beginning from the mall that it's in for some reason. I mean, I guess, but uh, the guy who's like the main guy, the guy who like says the line to the jeweler goes in there. And then when Gal Gadot uh, or Gal Gadot arrives the first, like, and she like lassos one dude, Mm-hmm. Or no, no, sorry. This is when he, uh, that guy grabs a baby mm-hmm. and dangles it 
over. Right. <laughs> like he's going to throw a baby the other, off the second uh, floor. Even the other guys in the heist are like, don't dangle a baby. <laughs> don't <laughs> dangle a baby. That, and yeah, because yeah, there's a little bit of banter. And then one of the guys, inexplicably, it's one of my favorite sounds and like shots I've seen in a long time. For like, I don't know why, but the guy just goes, no. <laughs> like, he's just <laughs> the guy with the gray no. mustache. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's just like, it's like, what? Okay. <laughs> like, why you were really bringing some high energy <laughs> to this moment where you should be like hiding like this is a perfect time for you to get away with the crime and you're just singing no i don't know i love that part that whole thing was a mess that whole thing i think uh the easy choice i think is the mall scene that it starts with i think it uh it is funny and silly but the action's pretty good and it's like heartwarming and it has good character development how like she kills all the surveillance cameras and you're like oh she's keeping herself a secret like it's it's good action storytelling uh i think the part that um i almost like the most uh or i would if it was in a different movie was when they're in the jet they just steal a jet with this with handsome man's body uh they are in midair and she's like you know uh, my dad zeus he made the island visible i'm gonna try i'm gonna try something and so she just makes the jet invisible and i love how that's such a yada yada way to explain like an iconic Wonder Woman thing, but almost like right. a complete fuck you to some nerd like me who's like, I wonder how they're going to make the invisible jet. They're just like, hey, hey, asshole, I'm going to fucking do it with a magic spell and then never use that magic spell again. And then they fly through some right. fireworks, like just because they're like, how do you show up an invisible jet? They're like, let's sh- fly through some Fourth of July fireworks. I'm like, this is such a perfect tone, like such a perfect I don't give a fuck attitude. Uh, and then just the rest of the movie is not like that at all. The rest of the movie is just fussy and insane and, and stupid. And uh, yeah. like for one fleeting moment, like, it was you know, just a, a brash type of like, it was like a Robert Rodriguez moment. Just, I don't fucking give a shit. Just, uh, this is what we want to do. And this is how we're going to get there. It's not like the, um, it's not like, you know, like a ship that became beloved like let's say i don't know like the millennium falcon right. that was needed by someone in the movie so out of circumstance right. it just was thrown into the movie and then at that so that justifies its existence and then on top of that you just had good times there yep. like you just were good and the ship looked cool and that's why we remember it you know like the reason we in remember the invisible jet is more or less because it's a cool concept mm-hmm. And it's like what she just uses all the time. This is just like a uh, obvious pandering. Like you're saying, it's just saying like, uh, let's roll a Dex wonder woman. Let's try to get in as many yeah. as we can. She's got a boomerang tiara. She's got bulletproof bracelets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they just appear and it's just like, mm-hmm. okay, all right. And for me, I don't, I've not read any comics, so <laughs> I any. don't understand things. Huh? Just any. Yeah, not really. Okay. No, I didn't grow up reading comics or anything. I'm like, yeah, I'm like the worst friend of like all of my nerd friends. <laughs> like uh, they all hate me uh, because I can't I can't keep up. But like with this, this kind of stuff, at least my superpower becomes like that did not work on me. Ah. Why? Because I'm the litmus test for I don't have any like love for mm-hmm. this to begin with. So it either worked or it didn't. You know what I mean? And it just doesn't work when they do stuff like this. Yeah. All right. Can I tell you my favorite part? Of course. Good. I'll, I'm going to yeah. ask permission now every time I interrupt something. <laughs> You're um, so weird. <laughs> the, uh, I have an, a real answer, meaning it's not an ironic favorite. It really is my favorite part, which is <laughs> that uh, I think if I had to pick the moment, it's best encapsulated with... Uh, when she, when Gal Gadot, when Wonder Woman herself, you guys, investigates literally the thing that is obvious to ask, which is, which you'd think Max Lord should have asked himself by now, what are you doing this for? Don't you have enough? Like, you're sowing all this right. chaos. You're wrecking the thing that you're trying to own, which is the Earth. Don't you have enough? And he says, why not more? We want what we want. And uh, I cried in this scene. I am a sucker. That doesn't make the movie good per se, but I want to tell you what I was crying about because I think it's something that's really there and that it's moving that we're getting movies with that woven in. Um, Or it could also be reflected in the line, even now you patronize me from uh, Cheetah, which is 
I think it's very specific that they chose patronize, you know, the patriarchy, what have you. It is a girl power thing. And I am for that. And I think what the best part of the movie is that this movie literally is emphatically stating (laughs) that it's not for us. Like the movie's point, one of the main takeaways, I think, is we should not Mm. be doing this podcast. Like we, (laughs) who are we to speak to? We're Um, the baddies. (laughs) Yeah, because at the end, in the part where I was crying, Wonder Woman is literally speaking to everyone in the world. And against, and this is what I I think are good, solid, underlying structural choices. Max Lord, an immigrant who changed his name in order to assimilate to white culture um, and who buys completely into the myth of meritocracy and feels like I work so hard, I should have more America's like his whole thing is that he bought too much into the myth of America. Mm -hmm. I think it's very specific that he like changed his name to assimilate and he sort of represents white manifest destiny. And I think it's actually pretty perfect. I don't know if he's in the comics or if he was created for the movie, but the idea that, The toxicity of white America is a sleazy salesman offering you cash for gold. Like that really works for me. Mm -hmm. A sleazy salesman offering you easy solutions and saying, cheat, take the shortcut. You just have to want it. That's America. You don't have to earn it. You just have to want it. Um, To me, that really, really worked. And when Wonder Woman said, I'm not talking to you, I'm talking to everyone else. I was like, Oh yeah, she's not talking to me. This movie isn't for me. We should call Sean and tell him we're not doing the podcast. <laughs> um, but it'll be fun to do. Amazing. And that was my no, favorite part. You're right about the that. The amount, <laughs> the amount of authorial intent you have given uh, to this this mess of a script. Uh, it's I'm. If you're moved, it's by absolutely it, arguable whether it was intentional. But right. that's what I think is there. If you, squint. I think it was. Okay. It's I not mean, impossible. It's like I said, there's a reason that they started with the uh, s- sequence where it's like no shortcuts. And just like mm-hmm. Swaim said, he represents shortcuts. Sure. I also think they were trying to do a 310 to Yuma thing with a very subtle uh, cheetah being in love with Diana and being frustrated about that. Is that just me? Am I crazy and digging myself a deeper hole? But there was like, there was, what was the specific line? Um, oh, she I says she like, this is my yeah. friend, the pilot. And she's like, this is my uh, old friend, the pilot. And she's like, oh, I'm Diana's new friend. Putting them on the same level. Is this anything? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that it's, it was pretty clear no. she had a crush on Diana. I thought that was clear, but Abe disagrees. Maybe not a romantic No, I crush. just think she, it's like, not. I, I don't know about <laughs> I don't know about what Sean's saying, but like maybe. But uh <laughs> like no, I don't think so. Because it's just new friends and old friends are different situations. It's I don't know why that, that would be specific that we're like on the same level. I don't even know if that's the implication of what she's saying. Uh it's I think you're looking for too much there. Yeah, I'm trying to make the movie a very comprehensive statement about intersectionality and mo- and pushing progressive ideals. Mm-hmm. Because it that can it, be that, and, and not if it is that, it makes me happy, and I like it for that reason. Clunkiness aside, right. and the other point I would want to make is that that's what I meant. Like all this shit is vanilla pudding, and this one was not egregiously worse than to the point where I'm like. Uh, Patty Jenkins should be allowed to make if, you know, if um, who's the guy that did Joker? Todd Phillips? It's Todd Phillips. Yeah. Oh, yeah. OK. If Todd Phillips can make whatever he wants over and over, like so should Patty Jenkins. And it's all generic crap. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. I, I do mean, think there's a statement about sexism in the nature of the film as an artifact of our time. Like, sure. I believe in the importance of just getting more female voices in the superhero genre. If there has to be a superhero genre, like if that's what we're doing, I guess I'm actually really glad. I'm glad we're getting wonder woman out of the way. Uh, to be honest, because just like Superman, who's, or, you know, I guess if we're doing, uh, you know, gendering this, it's like the counterparts, like the least interesting hero, right? 
because of all the reasons that Sean said, like uh, just superpowers, right. just complete authority in almost every situation, uh, you know, authoritarian rule, so to speak. And one of the coolest things that they did with, uh, you know, in like other superhero myths is like they they do the whole uh, kryptonite kind of thing. She's right. starting to lose Iron her power. Man one 3, of the coolest, he loses the suit. Yeah. One of the best things to do with someone that they have ultimate power is take their power away. Yeah. Okay. So getting her out of the way is important in like in a longer sense in terms of these superhero movies to me, because what's happening here is we're getting the boring superhero out of the way. The Iron Man's in like the, the more enjoyable people uh, to watch the more, like I'd say the people who are more beloved. I don't know if that's necessarily true for, uh, fans of the comics and maybe Sean can speak mm. to that, but like, well, Harley I think that people Wonder like <laughs> the thing about Harley Quinn uh, Superman is a great and Wonder example. Woman She's a good comics, I guess. Uh, I, I don't want to interrupt. Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I just wanted to say that I think that we have a, there's a, there's a big problem right now. Uh, we were, I think we were hungry for a powerful female superhero and Wonder Woman one was kind of a salve, but Diana isn't charismatic. She's kind of boring. So we're probably, in my opinion, under dunking on Wonder Woman one, which when that came out, my read was that you couldn't really like talk bad on that movie. That movie was like. (laughs) <laughs> that movie was considered some pe- people admitted. Yeah. The act three was nonsense, but like they really loved wonder woman. And then this movie kind of got uh, critically panned all around. It was lukewarm mm-hmm. at best. And I think we're over dunking on wonder woman two because I think wonder woman one and wonder woman two suffer the same problems. And I think what that comes down to it is it's about the character and it's about how they navigate the story and what they choose as the interesting parts of the story. I think Swaim has a good point, but I think ultimately they didn't push that up forward enough. And it was just about uh, making her seem awesome, which we've already seen in all superhero movies. And sometimes it's fun. It does feel fun here, like the mall sequence, but then it kind of gets lost in translation. Uh, I, that's just what, how I felt when I watched the movie Mm -hmm. is I feel that like, that's the same situation that happened in Wonder Woman one. If you look at that film, uh, this film is Wonder Woman, uh, 84 is undeniably larger in scope, which is kind of funny because the first one had world war one in it. So it kind of felt grander and more sweeping than I think the shots and the sequences actually. I never did fully figure out what era Chris Pine was from because (laughs) I haven't seen the first one and there are just little breadcrumbs i was like he yeah. could be from anywhere from the 20s to the early 60s i think mm-hmm. <laughs> well when he saw that train right, his right. mind was blown so i mean i would yeah. i would have put him back to the ice age because you didn't get it from when he looked at the plane and said look at these games <laughs> <laughs> so 50s when is he from you said world war one that's like yeah. 1917 yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Jesus. he's like 1920. Yeah, I think. Or 1970. Which probably yeah. predates Gams. I don't know. I, I don't use Gams too often, but oh, is that I see true? that in 40s oh, okay. and 50s movies. I think That's of true. it as 50s, yeah. Yeah. Noir. Hmm. Well, that's that's my opinion on it anyway. On I mean, I, <laughs> No, on Wonder Woman 1. Yeah. I think Wonder Woman 1 suffers the same problems yes, as like but all the of same, this stuff. Yeah. All, yeah, all the plot written act threes, the bad decisions made by the villains, you know, that's on Patty Jenkins in the studio. It's not on any one particular person, really. But like both movies do this. Gal Gadot is pretty imposing and plays the role off. Uh, Kristen Wiig in this movie is pretty good as the antagonist because she's charming. Mm-hmm. But um, mm-hmm. with the ex- exception in the DC canon and even in the MCU canon, because uh, like look at Black Widow and I mean I love what the MCU is doing with Wanda Vision only because I don't love that I don't love that sh- series, but it's undeniable to me that Elizabeth Olsen is really good because they're giving her stuff to do. But when you look at female superheroes in the State of the Union right now, it's not that good. It's still not that good. Um, I thought that Birds of Prey was probably the best option that we have so far. Um, I don't Mm -hmm. think Wonder Woman... I wish Wonder Woman was better is my point. Yeah, because you can't... We, as the most generic and catered to category of human in the country we were born in, we can't appreciate (laughs) 
<laughs> what representation feels like. It's not special to me, you know, uh-huh. but seeing Black Panther, despite how good or not good you think Black Panther is, and it's actually pretty solid as far as these generic Marvel movies go, um, I would say. Uh, the three people on this podcast can't appreciate what is appreciable about representation, I believe. That, that. may be true. That's that may fair, be true. But I do feel like I have better judgment than most of the people involved in making Wonder Woman 1984. That yeah. seems objectively true, <laughs> undeniably, <laughs> by comparing like your writing choices and things you've done and their writing sure. choices in this. Sure. <laughs> yeah. The uh, The nonsense of it all is is pretty aggressively like at the surface level. It's, it's one of the easiest movies to crack, uh, that I've ever, in terms of like trying to poke holes in the plot. Right. You know, a Batman has plot holes like Joker's or, uh, yeah. Heath Ledger's plan has a bunch of plot holes. If you view it from his point of view in dark Knight. but you have to think it through a bit. Chris Nolan knows how to tuck the impossibilities away. This is right. they're right on the surface. Like when you this. see a, a bus drive out of a, a bank and just join a, a column of other school buses. I mean, yeah, yeah. I'll oh, let yeah. it go. I'm like, sure. If I was the bus behind the that bus, I wouldn't falling. I wouldn't tell anybody about that. About the giant oh, hole it drove out of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The the bus driver behind going, oh, good. The dust bus has arrived. <laughs> <laughs> Came out of that hole in the bank. <laughs> All right, keep, keep I was it down, kids. For him all day. I mean, this script <laughs> ends with, and this is one of my pet peeves: a line that's supposed to be resonant, but no legwork has been done. Gam work, sorry. It's so many things, so many things. That's the final line of the movie, <laughs> and it's not fully clear to me what the subtext or meaning. It's just a line. Yeah. It doesn't. It's just words. It's like <laughs> literally the last line of the movie is like such a whiffed. And I think that speaks to the whole that experience. Could have been but yeah. Well, the thing about Wonder Woman uh, from the comics uh, and then the original show, I think, actually captured uh, the character pretty well is that she's a woman of peace, she's trained for war. It's very much like the ideals America had in the 50s that were like, we're such a good and noble people, but oh my God, we'll fuck you up if we if we have to. But that's like our mm-hmm. last resort. And so Wonder Woman mm-hmm. came to America and she's just like cheerfully walking through problems. And she was just as invincible on that TV show, but like she was having a nice time. And if someone like fucked with her, she'd be like, oh, you shouldn't point these guns at me and, you know, squash their gun and, and kind mm-hmm. of happily take them to jail. And they, the movie, it feels like they were trying to... Uh, capture that and then just completely forgot about it. Like the idea of her, uh, the, whatever, going back to the handsome man, it, the idea of having Wonder Woman being any part of that is absurd. It's just like a fundamental misunderstanding of uh, what makes that character that character. Like her sense of right and wrong is... Uh, Been completely re... Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, yeah. That's that's what defines her. There's there's such a, a courage to her and it's such a you know, conviction to all of her morals and they they're from a place of of intellectual learning and like you know utopian vision so it's like it's not even bogged down with like all of our crap and all the lies we tell ourselves it's like she comes from a place that's on paper perfect and utopian and those are the values that she brings to america and like there's some sort of conflict there but for her to show up and be like, yeah, I guess I'm okay with this. Like, let's, you get in that body, we'll have sex a few times, we'll steal a jet with his face and then we'll go to another country, fucking ram into a tank with a cab. Just put that body in a ton of danger. And Um, then finally at the end, uh, well, I will renounce the wish. It's the right thing to do. Literally at the last second, I don't really want to. The world will be destroyed if I don't. God. (laughs) Oh, well. And also she was like laying maybe too low, like the, the, she showed up to save people at the mall, but like, other than that, it seemed like she led a really sedentary life. Whereas I feel oh, like she didn't solve a ton of <laughs> random street crime. Yeah. That's for sure. She, yeah, she she picked her battles. She was not living up to the responsibility of of say Spider Man. She, she only cared about the main quest. She did not do any fetch quest <laughs> right. bullshit for anyone. Yeah, without knowing really what the main quest was, so she was just biding her time. <laughs> that's what it seemed like yeah it wasn't because clear she, what the she can't be known she can't be known this whole section of time otherwise then right. the other movies don't work if she's a known superhero 
uh, she can't have. Right. She has to have like these fifty years because the immortality. Or so angle. where she just you know took a little nap. I would have said just don't make this fucking movie then. You know, yeah, set the set it in a different that, time. I I, I would have there, really, there wasn't a ton new. of point to have it in the eighties. Like most of the things that they're commenting on are just as valid to criticize today. Uh, the stuff mm. Swain was saying that uh, you know. This, oh, and this, I forgot it was in the eighties. Yeah, like there's, there's no, no reason for love it. for the eighties or flair of the eighties other than literally like the art department did their job and made the mall look like it's from the eighties. Yeah, there was nothing. There was no eighties vibe. You'd expect like probably Thor five or Ragnarok. six gags, right? Yeah, Thor Ragnarok. Thor is... Ragnarok had more eighties vibe than this movie. That's literally <laughs> about the eighties. To put it in the title, it's yeah. weird. Well, it's kind of like vanilla eighties, and Thor Ragnarok is like glam rock. So it's like, but did you we, see the poster remember- for this? It was leaning glam rock, and then it didn't execute on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of. I think kinda. there's a disconnect between every department. Like, I don't think there's a unified vision about what it wasn't, the story is trying to be packaged it, as. Yeah, yeah, it definitely wasn't as in like you, we all absolutely agree that it. <laughs> For a movie that has 1984 in the title and is like a clear, like it's a superhero movie, so it's clearly doing like a like a vibe. Mm-hmm. It didn't feel like that. It felt like a generic, like someone were to make a 1980s film in 1980s. It's not someone making a 1980s film in 2020. It's not looking it's back. It has, no, it has no rise self-awareness. It just literally is like, this movie could have... Yeah, it's set in the 1980s. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All the cars are like 80s cars. Mm-hmm. You know, people, you know, have fanny packs and parachute pants, etc. The color schemes are somewhat that way. Oh, and Chris Pine like, was yeah. charming too. Yeah, the whole cast did a good job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they just didn't have a lot to work with. I think I have another theory about why I think this uh, film was really dunked on. Um, which is that I think pre COVID we were already reaching this superhero fatigue for a lot of people. And then the virus hits and everything got pushed back. Right. And the separation for whatever plans like the MCU and DC had for their future properties, they slowed it down. And that's obviously making them bolster the importance to keep them culturally relevant and marketing these things as more important, like all of the properties in the superhero world that we've seen, uh, like are kind of bigger deals now because there's fewer of them. I think they finished their story after Endgame and Endgame, and then in DC they did like what did they do? The Batman versus Superman kind mm-hmm. of things uh, and Justice League. So they kind of like reached like a pass, right? And we all and they kind of had right? to. Huh? We all loved those those two movies you mentioned. Yeah, those were well. I mean, DC has its own problems because I don't honestly. There's more, more charm in one movie of like Marvel than any of the DC ones. Sure. Maybe Aquaman, maybe Wonder <laughs> Woman one. I don't know. Like, not really. I don't really care about them, so I'm not the guy to say it. But I'm just trying to observe why people are like really angry at this film, and okay. uh, I think that. They had to. They kind of have to overcome this restart. That's nearly impossible because everyone's starting to realize superhero movies are kind of dumb. Uh, and when you're taken out of like the repetition of it all, where they're all coming out and they're bigger and be- bigger and bigger and bigger every time, more people, more. You're doing this stuff, and it's like I, I lost focus because the last time I checked in with this guy was like honestly two years ago, and I forgot who he is. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and I feel like Wonder Woman suffered a little bit from that. I think like Chris Pine's character suffers a little from it. Um, now, that's just me being once again a superhero casual viewer uh, as opposed to someone who actually like cares about these properties and uh, a lot. But I'm just, you know, that's I think why a lot of people are panning it uh, when it came out and still, you know, obviously it's not a good film. Yeah. Well, I went in with Star Wars I would say pretty low flawless. expectations. Uh, I thought the first Wonder Woman was adequate. It was it was a little dull, uh, but uh, and usually uh, DC movies are almost universally garbage. So I was like, okay, this is going to be sucky. And I was like, yeah, this is not as good as I was worried it would be. You know what I mean? It's it it was uh, it was I guess uh, boring. Is is this you know? It's a boring word to use, but I found myself losing interest in the movie so often. 
uh, which mm-hmm. is not even on Batman versus Superman. I'm like, this sucks, but I'm also kind of like, I, I kind of want to see what happens next. This is like, these are pretty amazing effects. And like, these are big characters I grew up with, you know, smashing through oh, buildings. Can we mention, like, like, I mean, given the Zack Snyder connection, like I understand we're all sick. I am sick of like the floaty, the standard rate of slow motion at which superhero fight scenes seem to be legally obliged to take place. Sure. But, uh, it objectively looks cool. Like it will always look cool. The sequences in 300 that look cool still look cool. It's just like Michael Bay. It's not sophisticated, but the thing that Zack Snyder and people who seem who work with him seem to bring to the table is a thing. It's yeah. it looks neat. It's That's got why its own we style. fell for it. Yeah. You don't have to like it, but it I think you could argue it's cool. Why not? There's some pretty cool shots. In it's Wonder almost Woman it's almost a Western wuxia tradition, you know, mm-hmm. our own version. There's also some really bad ones though, like her running in on the highway. <laughs> yeah. Good lord! And then she like saves that kid and like just totally eats shit with the kid in her arms. Like I, I was embarrassed. <laughs> I was legitimately embarrassed. Uh, and I like granted, I know a thing or two about making movies because I dissect this stuff, and it's like the the job I've done for a while. But it's like also, I know that there's a lot of things that are hard to do when uh-huh. you're a director, especially like the the problems compound and compound and obviously the like reshoots reshoots weren't an option for this movie um like it was for other movies but like there's just they real slapstick uh visual effects sequences there's a few like once again in the mall she like whipped around she like kicks on the ground and slides and it, and there's like a shot that it's like wow really motivated really looks cool now i'm watching a cool action sequence in a uh, like top of the line action movie there they had that there was that stuff mm-hmm. i'm not saying that patty jenkins didn't do her job except that you should always be doing your job and when you cut to other stuff where it's like that is laughable I'm sorry, just watch it. Like it it just doesn't hold up. Then I'm like, what is going on here? There has to be something else going on that we as an audience aren't privy to because they on this high scaffolding, they typically don't make this those mistakes. Right. And they are making these mistakes right now. I think it's an overall laziness by the studios about these movies probably. They know they can churn them out and it won't matter, and that's the exact opposite of what dc should be doing right now because they're losing and have been and they've never been on top well i guess that's not true they were on top when nolan did the batmans mm-hmm. and uh, but like since then when it comes to the animated shazam movies and Aqu- shazam and aquaman back to back really slayed at the box office actually i do like oh, okay. shazam a lot my daughter uh loves shazam and so i've probably seen it 15 times and i'm still every time i see it i'm like this, this is a weirdly good movie for dc yeah, because it doesn't seem like a DC movie, right? Mm-hmm. Huh. I wonder why <laughs> that, that is. Yeah. yeah, but again, the full range of... Well, never mind. <laughs> I don't, like, I don't want to... I don't mean to... I understand... Hmm. I don't want to besmirch anyone whose interest and passion is around the subject, but I'm just... I am numb to superhero mythology, period, pretty much. All right. Like... Mm-hmm. Yeah, Shazam was relatively good, but who cares? I just, I'm just so tired. I'm so tired. Of this. <laughs> so t- you want to watch Nightcrawler again, baby? You All interconnected get cinematic universes. <laughs> I just want, yeah, quick punchy shit like Nightcrawler that gets in, gets out. <laughs> Whoever decided to you pick this movie uh, clearly made a terrible decision. <laughs> All I know is it was not me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was. Can we all agree it was Robert Brockway? Is that fine? <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Right. How dare he? How dare he? Uh, I don't know. What else do we talk about with this movie? Oh, that's more than enough time. Oh, yeah. On I think we're, <laughs> well, for you, because you are you were tapped out already at the beginning. I actually thought you had a good, you had a good point. You had a good point about it's not for us. They, you know. That does stop the podcast a little bit in its tracks, <laughs> but like other than that, like it's a pretty good observation. Uh, I, I didn't see that as much from from what you're saying, but now that you phrase it that way, I do think it's important to note. Like we are not the guy. Maybe the reality of this movie uh, is that like it's not for us, and therefore uh, all the criticism of this movie is unwarranted. I feel uh, like I've done enough uh, internal. Uh, 
work on my feminism and uh, external mm-hmm. work on my feminism and read enough Wonder Woman comics and watched enough Wonder Woman TV show that I deserve to at least consider myself eligible to be a part of the Wonder Woman conversation. I mean, whether it was intended for me or not, uh, I do think it's fair for me to look at it and judge it as a participant of, yeah, of the audience. I think that's right. More so than me. I'm just a, you know, uh, yak yak on a podcast <laughs> who hasn't read any comic books. But uh, yeah, no, I think that there's, I think both sides have value on that uh, situation. I don't think there's one is right and one is wrong. I think there's bad takes on this. And I think that this movie can legitimately be called bad for some of the maneuvers that it does. Sure. Um, but whether or not it had a poignance that we missed, I guess, is something that remains to be seen. Um, yeah. Well, I thought Swain That's was very generous it. giving it credit for those types of things. I don't know yes. if I agree. I love you, Michael. But um, we're going to fight to the death for this. I often yeah. fill in dots for movies and games. <laughs> uh, it's and true. it's not always clear whether those dots were meant to be filled in or were just random scattered dots. <laughs> and I'm yeah. like giving them a lot of extra credit. But yeah, hey, for people who didn't get my Robert Brockway reference, why don't you hip them to Oh, I would love to what plug you us. got going on. I work Please. with this gentleman, Robert Brockway, on a site called 1900hotdog.com. Uh, support our Patreon uh, because it's the only business model that allows comedy writers like us to live. Uh, every day, uh, Preach. every weekday, we we find some sort of a cursed artifact from uh, from a wrong dimension, whether it's uh, a martial arts book or a workout video. Things that are inherently silly, we find exceptionally silly versions of them. And then, um, what do you call it? We make fun of it. Everyone has a great time. Uh, mm-hmm. You do japes. We do the japes. Well, you grind it we, up into a tube of perfect homogenous deliciousness much exactly. like yeah i have to dog. say you guys really raised the bar and i kind of hate you for it <laughs> i kind of hate you for oh, it oh i mean real talk you absolutely stole some there has to be some mathematical mass of people that left us when you launched which is all good <laughs> baby the game is the I, game hey, look what i would love to do is get it back to a place where one of us is just big enough and we can like merge them all together and we just sort of Restaff it like the way we kind of were at crack. Yeah, but like stop fucking around. We, yeah. Cody should we heard hire us all. That's right? true. Cody Cody's is Papa pretty. Bear at this point. Cody's <laughs> mm-hmm. crushing it. Mm-hmm. Cody has this There's, this thing that I don't know if I'll ever have where he can say something that just seems so blunt and obvious, but just it, it, somehow it gets the words in exactly the right order where it's like funny, and so he'll have sort of the same mm-hmm. take as anyone would. But it's like, how the fuck do you make that so funny, Cody? Uh, I love him for yeah. it. I think he's, yeah. he's and he's cultivated good. a persona where people, un- which is very difficult on Twitter, especially people mm-hmm. understand that ninety nine percent of what he writes is going to be the opposite is true, which yes. uh, usually gets lost in the mix. But he's so relentless with his deadpan irony that I like that. Like by and large, people are like. Well, of course he says that. He means the opposite <laughs> of that, which is a tough trick to pull off. Usually yeah. people can't keep up with that shit. Yeah, he deserves all his success. The dude, his voice is so clear. I think I have yeah. A, yeah, but so do we. So do all yeah, of so us. Do we. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I think I have a theory. I, I have a theory of why Cody can get away with that, though. I think it's because uh, of his enormous um, dick. This has been a Small Beans Endeavor. We're a bunch of pals who make podcasts, sketches, music, web series, and movies. The Beans always have new ideas percolating, so make sure to check us out at patreon.com slash smallbeans. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash smallbeans, where you can browse all of our current and past content, see what we've got planned in the future, and learn how your support can help the Small Beans grow into huge, giant monster beans. If you enjoyed this content module, please like, rate, subscribe, or tell a friend about us. We love you.